Let me ask you a question. Are you genuinely excited to see Solo, a Star Wars story? Is Rogue One your favorite Star Wars movie? Do you really need to see exactly how many Bothans died to bring us this information? Well, if you search your feelings, I'm betting the answer to all of these questions is no. In order for the franchise to live, Star Wars needs to let the past die. Since 2015's The Force Awakens, there's been a brand new Star Wars movie every year, something that will continue until the inevitable heat death of the universe, and that's fine. It's fine. We're fine. Paying a visit to the galaxy far, far away is one of my favorite cinematic pastimes, but Lucasfilm's inability to let go of familiar faces, places, and settings is slowly suffocating Star Wars with a forced choke of nostalgia, and that is exactly what we're going to talk about on today's episode of The Dan Cave. Since May 25th, 1977, we've spent hundreds of hours in the galaxy far, far away. It's a vast, expansive space fantasy universe full of alien races, interstellar conflict, and limitless possibility. Yet for nearly the entirety of those 41 years, we've almost singularly focused on the exploits of the Skywalker family, their friends, associates, and the villains with whom they cross paths. Realistically, we've only covered a time span of approximately 60 years or so following the adventures of the same people over and over again. If we're supposed to be in an entire galaxy far, far away, then why do we only spend time with Luke, Han, Leia, and the rest of them? Especially now that we've not only had a core trilogy focused on their characters, but also a prequel, and now a sequel trilogy too. Perhaps it's time to heed the words of the thickest prodigal son in the galaxy. Let the past die. Kill it if you have to. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. Though Kylo Ren's words were a bit more nihilistic and shirtless in the context of The Last Jedi, he makes an interesting point. Accepting the past and understanding it are crucial to informing the present and the future. Feeling beholden to the past in a way that hinders good storytelling, though, is a disservice to the narrative and the fans. I mean, look at the much maligned prequel trilogy. Were they good movies? Well, it depends on who you ask. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. On paper, the prequels are a great story, a chronicle of how the Chosen One, he who was supposed to bring balance to the Force, was tempted by dark powers and helped a Machiavellian madman plunge an entire galaxy into war and install an autocratic nightmare regime. The way they were told, though, let's just say that George Lucas probably should have worked things out with Marsha Lucas. It wasn't until shows like The Clone Wars and Rebels that this time period was meaningfully explored in a way that George Lucas perhaps originally intended, thoroughly, thoughtfully, and with an eye towards creating compelling stories within an existing framework. In the case of Star Wars anthology films, though, Lucasfilm doesn't just accept the past, they have an unhealthy dependency on it. Case in point, Solo, a Star Wars story, aka the standalone movie that nobody asked for, mainly because it doesn't stand alone, rather it stands adjacent and on the shoulders of the canon, connected by these unbreakable bonds of corporate fear and misguided fan service, existing to fill in a gap that nobody was asking about. Honestly, were you wondering how Han met Chewie? Do you crave answers to know how Han Solo made the infamous Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs? Do you give a womp rat's ass if that Wookiee we see nearly die on a space train is actually Chewie's wife from the infamous Star Wars Holiday Special? I mean, kinda, but not really. Rogue One fares slightly better by giving us a mostly brand new cast of characters who have a connection to the larger narrative we've come to know and love, but the stakes feel non-existent because we already know their mission's successful. I mean, sometimes this can work quite well. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Other times, well, you get this. You can say that it's about the journey, not the destination, but it's hard to feel truly invested in the journey when you know that everyone on it is gonna die after giving the world's most important USB drive to Princess Leia. Connecting A to C can be an interesting exercise, but Rogue One's insistence on dredging up familiar faces in technologically horrifying ways at the expense of character development, among other things, actively hindered the story from achieving its true potential. The Last Jedi, on the other hand, is an excellent example of a Star Wars film that embraces the past while simultaneously building something new rather than just treading water like so many Admiral Akbars at so many Mon Calamari pool parties. I mean, wait, can he swim? I don't know. He's dead now. It's by no means a perfect movie, but it takes risks with the existing canon, subverting expectations and blowing up traditions in order to build something new and pass the torch to a new generation of characters. Saying that it killed your childhood or ruined Star Wars is an infantile and frankly insane thing to say. I mean, the only person who ruined your childhood is you and your inability to accept that constantly retreading familiar ground is ultimately a creatively bankrupt endeavor that will drain the franchise of what made it so special in the first place. 
Now, it's easy to understand why Lucasfilm has yet to travel into the proverbial unknown regions of Star Wars filmmaking, because we're addicted to nostalgia. We need to feel that rush of endorphins from recognizing a winking nod to something that we already know and love. It's kind of like comfort food. When you alter the status quo and try something new, especially with something like Star Wars, people get scared because it makes them uncomfortable. You altered the deal. I mean, you can pray they don't alter the deal any further, but to do so is, quite frankly, a fool's errand. Change is inevitable because the alternative to change is stasis, and stasis is death. We don't want to see the same thing over and over again. Filling in increasingly granular gaps in existing canon is a recipe for disaster. It's the slow death of sinking into creative quicksand, and that's going to ultimately lead us to something like Han Solo, the Tuesday before A New Hope, and that's going to be the last thing we see before we die. I don't want that. Do you? No. So where do we go from here? Nerdist associate editor slash our resident Porg whisperer Amy Ratcliffe penned an excellent essay on Nerdist.com explaining that for Star Wars' next trilogy, which purports to introduce new characters from a corner of the galaxy that Star Wars lore has never explored before, Ryan Johnson and his collaborators should look to the distant past or the distant future. Like, take us to the early days of the universe for this primordial battle of good and evil between Jedi and Sith. Show us the Old Republic, a sprawling space opera set thousands of years in the past. Or take us well beyond the events of Episode Nine and let us see how the effects of the Skywalker saga have rippled throughout the ages. Give us experiments in genre like the ones Eric Diaz suggested in his essay on Nerdist. I mean, can you imagine if we got a movie version of what Star Wars 1313 was going to be? This gritty crime drama set in an underground world full of hired assassins, bounty hunters, and saboteurs? Or what about like a straight up horror movie set in the Outer Rim? The mind reels at the possibilities, and that is the true spirit of what Star Wars is all about. Elemental, mythic story telling set in a faraway land of infinite hope and potential. To ignore that is a short-sighted mistake. It's worse than Jar Jar Banks delivering 50 pounds of extremely coarse sand directly to your door. Because I know you, you hate sand. But what do you think? Do you agree that Star Wars needs to let go of its past? What do you want to see Star Wars do from here? Let me know in the comments below and give me a thumbs up while you're there. Search your feelings. You know you want to. Now be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that notification bell button, fam, or else you might miss next week's episode all about the story of a gang of Somali pirates that tried to take over a cargo ship only to get their butts kicked by the boat's captain, who just so happens to be the creator of Wing Chun and Captain Phil Ipman. Until next time, keep on digging. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At Captain Aaron asks, pizza taco or taco pizza? That's a great question, Captain Aaron, and also maybe a war crime. I don't know, the UN Tribunal will get back to you on that. As a self-styled pizza connoisseur, there can only be one answer, and that is taco pizza. I mean, we already have ground beef as a semi-acceptable topping for pizza, so why not extend that a bit further to include other taco fixins? Because honestly, what the actual hell would a pizza taco even be? Just like a tortilla shell wrapped around a slice of pizza? That's insane. That's just a carbohydrated mitten with which to hold a pizza. Use your hands! Hard pass. Unless it's a Dorito shell, but even then, hard pass. But tell me, what side of this debate do you fall on? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you guys next time.